Oh, good afternoon from a very wet Gettysburg today. I think I'm the stereotypical Englishman with my umbrella, but that's just the way, you know, if you're raised in England, you don't really go anywhere without an umbrella, even on a lovely summer's day. So we're at Gettysburg. Um, today is Tuesday, the, what are we, 26th of April, uh, 2022. I'm at Gettysburg today. Um, I've been out taking some uh, uh, photos this morning, which I'm going to use in a classroom presentation. But as you know, when I'm out on about on Tuesdays, be it at Gettysburg or uh, Antietam, Brandywine, uh, Concord and Lexington, all the different places that I've been on my Tuesday tours where I'm uh, filming for myself, I always like to do a, a live stream tour as well. So I've done some of those at um, uh, lunchtime. I've done some of those in the afternoon. I've even done some in the evening as well. But we're out here at Gettysburg today. I've been wandering around Gettysburg this afternoon. And today I'm at the wheat field. Um, so the wheat field is one of those uh, locations, as many other locations are known at Gettysburg, that are just known geographically. Uh, we talk about the wheat field, we talk about the peach orchard, we talk about Little Round Top, we talk about Culp's Hill. So Gettysburg is, is known, and the battlefield at Gettysburg is known for um, actions that took place in specific geographic, geographic features. Sorry. So the fighting here at the wheat field took place on the second day of battle, so that's July 2nd, 1863. Now, I'd like to focus when I come out and do these things. I like to like break down the focus a little bit. So um, talk about uh, individual units or individual men. So uh, when I was out at Pioli and we talked about some of the individual men that fought the Battle of Pioli and the Pioli Massacre. And uh, uh, when we were at um, Concord and Lexington, we talked about some of the um, individuals that fought on uh, Lexington Green of those first shots. So sometimes that's a really good way of narrowing down um, the battle. When we're looking at a battle, we're looking at military history, it's easy to talk about um, this division did this, this army corps did this, this army versus this army on this day, this is who won. We're talking about it on a much macro operational scale, but sometimes it's just nice to come down from that scale to a more personal level talk about smaller units, talk about smaller actions, and we get like a better feel for um, what actually happened and, and what individual men um, went through on these battlefields, which is why I'm here at the wheat field today. Because I wanted to talk about one of the units that fought at the wheat field. So one of the units that fought at the wheat field is the Irish Brigade, very famous Irish Brigade. Now that's a brigade of five regiments, um, three from New York, one from Massachusetts, one from Pennsylvania, that were brigaded together um, because they contained predominantly Irish immigrants. So a lot of first generation Irish immigrants born in Ireland, moved to the United States, part of that Irish expatriate community. One of the famous things that Ireland is famous as an export for is its people. Ireland, uh, Irish people um, move and populate across the globe, which is why we have strong Irish American communities to this day. So there are also some second generation Irish Americans in there as well. Um, there people that have been born to that first generation of immigrants, but predominantly a, you know, a, a very strong traditional uh, Irish grouping. And uh, these men were recruited together. It's easy to recruit men from a community together. And so um, some of these regiments were formed and they were brigaded together as an Irish brigade. Um, the, 88th New York is one of those regiments. Now, the 88th New York is raised in um, 1861, so raised in that first year of the war, um, and raised from uh, New York Irishmen. The brigade itself is placed under the command of um, Colonel Thomas Marr. Uh, Thomas Marr is an interesting person. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Uh, the regiment itself is under the command of um, Colonel Baker. So. Thomas Marr. Thomas Marr is a very interesting person, born in Ireland um, and an Irish revolutionary. So Ireland 
is under the control in the 19th century, so those 1800s, Ireland is still part of um, the British Empire, um, still part, uh, considered to be part of Great Britain. Um, so, as you know, Britain comprises today, Britain comprises England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but the whole of Ireland at that time uh, was under British control. And uh, Now, Ma is one of the members of uh, the Fenian Brotherhood, an uh, Irish revolutionary group that wants to um, have independence from Britain and will fight, uh, be prepared to fight a revolutionary war to win that independence. Now, he is arrested by the British. Uh, and he is sentenced to transportation to Van Diemen's land. So he's sent all the way around to the far side of the world, to Australia, as a prisoner to live out the rest of his lives in a, in a prison colony. Well, he leads a daring escape. So he actually escapes from Australia, escapes by ship, and manages to make his way to the United States where the British can't get at him. And then he becomes prominent in uh, Irish-American politics in this country and as a leading member of the Irish American community. When the Civil War comes, he volunteers for service with the Union. He sees it as a fight for liberty um, in the same way that he sees the fight for Irish independence as a fight for liberty. So Ma um, is this uh, charismatic revolutionary leader that's placed in command of the brigade. The 88th New York was a particular favourite of his. The colours for the regiment were presented um, by Mrs Ma uh, to the regiment. So sometimes the regiment is nicknamed uh, Mars Own or even Mrs. Mars Own. Um, and uh, the 88th New York then is one of the uh, regiments in the Irish Brigade. I just want to take a look at the, um, the ground that we're looking at here. Let me flip the camera. So now I'm looking from, the rain has actually stopped so I can put down my umbrella for a little bit until the next bout of rain comes across. So, uh, that brigade itself is um, comprised, as I said, of three regiments, uh, 63rd New York, 69th New York, which is still the Fighting Irish today in the New York National Guard, 88th New York, 28th uh, Massachusetts, and 116th Pennsylvania. Uh, the brigade fought in the uh, Peninsula Campaign under General McClellan, uh, fought in the Seven Days Battles, uh, bloodied during those seven days battles. It fought again notably at um, Antietam in September of 1862 where the brigade, um, sorry the 88th um, itself uh, took 30% uh, casualties at the Battle of Antietam. It was a very a very bloody day um, for the Irish Brigade and for the 88th in particular. It fought again at Fredericksburg in December of 62 Another 137 casualties there. Uh, May of 83 at Chancellorsville, another 46 casualties. So you can see that the brigade itself has been through many battles. These are veteran soldiers by the summer of 1863, but also have taken significant casualties. So the number of men that are here present for duty is a, really a shadow of um, what should have been present for duty. So if you think of a I'm just going to come back to me for a moment. You think of a, a, an infantry regiment in that period um, at its peak strength when recruited should be a thousand men. Yeah, ten companies, a thousand men. Um, uh, hardly anybody ever manages to get a thousand men. You sometimes have 700, you sometimes have 800. But like you should have a significant amount of men. But this is a regiment that's been now through two years of war and some very, very heavy engagements. Um, particularly the Irish Brigade is shot to pieces at Antietam and shot to pieces again at Fredericksburg. If you've watched the, um, uh, the TNT movie Gods and Generals, the prequel to the Gettysburg movie, um, you'll see uh, a segment in there about the uh, Irish Brigade's assault on Marys Heights at Fredericksburg in December of 62 and the casualties that that brigade took um, heavy casualties there at Fredericksburg, assaulting that stone wall up on Mary's Heights. So the brigade and, and the 88th um, New York have taken heavy, heavy casualties. Now, so if we just look at the three um, New York regiments, those three New York regiments should, in theory, at full strength, number 3,000 men. When we come to Gettysburg and we come to July the 2nd, 1863, two years after this regiment has been enrolled, um, and uh, after two years of warfare and two years of bloody warfare, those 3,000 men, how many do you think are left? 
I mean, we, we could guess. We could say, I don't know, half of the half of them are casualties, or two thirds are casualties. But no, the actual number that is present for duty on that day is is barely two hundred and forty men. We're talking about such heavy losses that the 88th New York, um, that should in theory be a thousand men, on July the 2nd when it comes into battle, um, is about 120 men organized in two companies, Company A, Company B, under the command of a captain. Um, that's all that's left. Um, there's no colonel, there's no lieutenant colonel, there's no majors. Um, we're down to two companies from 10. And those companies themselves are under strength. So the 88th New York um, is one of the largest regiments in the brigade with about 120 men. So um, it's staggering that these men were still prepared to go into combat. Um, any rational army system would have uh, withdrawn those units from the active service with the Army of the Potomac and withdrawn them well into the rear and recruited them back up to strength before putting them into the field again. But the Army of the Potomac had um, no opportunity to do that. There was no choice. There was no other option. And the Army of the Potomac had to draw the Army of Northern Virginia to battle and had to fight. And so uh, units that were decimated, units that were beyond decimated, had to continue the fight. The 88th New York is one of those units. So they're here at Gettysburg on July the 2nd. Um, one of the notable events that happens to them, and you'll know, see a little segment in the Gettysburg movie, um, is that uh, there's a segment in the Gettysburg movie of the Irish Brigade kneeling in prayer, being blessed uh, uh, by a Catholic priest. I can't do the Catholic, I can do the Orth Russian Orthodox one. I can't, can't a Catholic one's the other way around, isn't it? So, being blessed, and they're being blessed by um, uh, Father William uh, Colby who was the regimental chaplain of the 88th New York and then became the brigade chaplain as well to the Irish Brigade. Now, Colby's an interesting man, uh, uh, Irish descent, obviously, Roman Catholic priest, obviously. Um, he was a priest and a professor uh, at the College of Notre Dame before the war. Um, he volunteered for service as a military chaplain, served throughout the war, and after the war, uh, he returned to Notre Dame and served um, consecutive terms as a president of the college. So the idea of Notre Dame um, earning its nickname the Fighting Irish, um, well I mean they didn't get that from Notre Dame because Notre Dame is uh, you know derives from uh, uh, Mary so um, we're talking you know the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris so it's got nothing to do with the Irish themselves. The nickname of uh, Notre Dame's sporting teams is the Fighting Irish comes from the Irish Brigade and comes from uh, Father Corby who took that nickname with him, and that nickname is the link between Notre Dame and the Irish Brigade in the engagements that the Irish Brigade um, fought in the Civil War. So that's a nice connection there that connects those um, two things if you're interested in college sports and you're interested in uh, Civil War history, military history, you've got the connection between the two there. So that's where they come from. So in that sequence in the movie, um, the Gettysburg movie, um, he, uh, Father Colby is uh, giving... Uh, it's not a mass, it's not a service, he's giving absolution to the men that are going to battle. Um, he's giving them absolution because they may die in battle. Uh, they need to be absolved and cleansed. He's not going to be out on the battlefield giving people um, uh, their last rites uh, on the battlefield. He needs to literally give blanket absolution, general absolution to the entire Irish Brigade before they go into battle. So it's very significant. Um, for them, um, that the, the connection to their Irishness is important and their connection to their religion is important because the majority of these men were uh, Roman Catholic um, and that is unusual in the United States, that's unusual in the Army of the Potomac. The uh, Army of the Potomac was a predominantly um, Protestant army, um, a lot of evangelicalism within the army. Look at um, Oliver Otis Howard, for example, the Christian general, uh, very evangelical in his Protestant theology. Um, distributing religious tracts to his men even and um, but uh, Roman Catholicism uh, at the time there's a lot of anti-Catholicism in American politics and um, that the Irish Brigade are prepared to say we're Irish and we're Catholic and to hell with the rest of you is very important for them it's a very important part of their identity uh, there is a statue of uh, Father Colby back up there on the hill a statue of him standing on a rock um, delivering his uh, absolution 
The statue was originally located somewhere else, up on one of the anniversaries. The men of the Irish Brigade were here and were like, actually, I don't think it was here. I think it was over there. So they moved the statue onto the rock, which may or may not be the rock that it actually uh, occurred on. So the brigade on uh, July the uh, 2nd, 1863, is led by um, Colonel Patrick Kelly, uh, previously commanding um, the uh, um, 88th. He commanded the 88th at Antietam, and uh, but uh, Colonel Mir commanding, uh, sorry, Colonel Mar commanding the um, brigade uh, had resigned after the Battle of Chancellorsville. He'd resigned from the army. He'd resigned his commission, and. Uh, command of the brigade had passed to um, Kelly of the 88th. So Kelly is in command of the regiment on the day that it comes into battle here as well. So the um, oh gosh, excuse me. <coughs> oh, I think I swallowed a midge. So the uh, 88th on that day, as I said, numbers just two companies of men. 126 men in total under the command of uh, Captain uh, Dennis Francis Burke, so under the command of a captain. It's just basically a small battalion. And we talked about how those a regiment should be a thousand men um, after some casualties, maybe 600, 500, but we're talking about down to 126 men. So, what were they doing here on the battlefield that day? Well, we need to talk about Daniel Sickles. And we're in part of that uh, salient on the battlefield that pushes out from the Union line, that on July the 2nd, um, Daniel Sickles, Major General, commanding 3rd Corps, is up there on the high ground. That's the Union line up behind us there, along Cemetery Ridge. And Dan Sickles is standing there, and he sees Confederate movement out in front of him. Um, so there's probably a Confederate assault coming towards his position. Now, he feels that where he is on the ridge is a little low lying on the ridge, and he looks out ahead of him, and the land here at Gettysburg rolls, the land here undulates. Um, it's part of just the geographic formation. When you look at the Appalachian Mountains, those are mountains. And then as those were formed in that, geolo in that geological period, um, Gettysburg is essentially the ripples of those mountains that have been formed. Um, uh, um, as the mountains are formed, Gettysburg's ridges and ridgelines are formed at that same time. So we're basically in the foothills of that Appalachian Ridge here. Um, so. Uh, there's undulating ground here, and Sickles looks out in front of him and sees, well, there's some flat land right in front of me, but then it rises a little bit, and then it drops away again. What if I move my core out to that high ground? Because if the Confederates get onto that high ground, they'll put some guns on it, they'll um, take advantage of the high ground, and I'll have to go down there and drive them off of the high ground. So why don't I get there first? So does he ask General Meade, the commanding, uh, commanding general of the Army of the Potomac, in operational command of all the corps that are here that day. Does he ask him for permission? No. Uh, does he tell him that he's going to do it? No, he just does it anyway. Um, in typical Dan Sickles style, uh, he just advances the entire third corps out into what then becomes a salient. Uh, that salient has both of its flanks, its right flank and its left flank out in the open. Um, and it occupies some of the areas that will become uh, well known as geographic areas here. It occupies the Peach Orchard. It will fight here at the wheat field. There'll be some fighting down there uh, at Plum Run and across here at, at Devil's Den. So I don't know if anybody else, when they come out on the battlefields, does little sketch maps. I always do a little sketch map when I come out so I can just remember where I am. So behind me here today, uh, this is uh, Wheatfield Road. Wheatfield Road is going to run up on my right here, it's going to continue westward um, and it's going to meet with the Emmitsburg Road. Uh, the Emmitsburg Road where it meets on the corner there, that's where the Peach Orchard is. Um, Wheatfield Road runs all the way back here. The Wheatfield Road actually runs all the way across now, um, Cemetery Ridge, over Cemetery Ridge and down onto Tawny Town Road. Um, but it goes up onto Cemetery Ridge, which is the main Union position. So if I'm, if I'm going to be, let's turn the camera and I'll be the Union position. So, little round tops over there. Devil's Den is behind me over there. Cemetery Ridge runs that way. And then, of course, East Cemetery Hill curves around there and Culp's Hill's over there. So the Union line stretches out that way. Wheatfield Road is coming this way. And the salient is formed when Third Corps comes out into this area with its flanks open on both sides. 
Um, not the most sensible tactical decision, but um, <laughs> there's Dan Sickles for you. So that's how we end up where we are out here in the wheat field. Let's turn back and have a look at the ground, at the wheat field. Now I've been coming to Gettysburg since, first time I came to Gettysburg was September of 1990. And that seems a long time ago now, it's over 30 years ago. But the first time I came out here, and this is the wheat field, which at the time was a wheat field. That's how it gets its name. Um, uh, it's a nice piece of ground here. It drains away nicely. If anybody um, uh, has farmland, um, as I do back home in England, but not here, obviously. But it drains away nicely. So there's good drainage here. The field will drain away nicely down to the, into the brook down there. And this is a good piece of land for uh, clear land for farming and growing wheat on. So it was the wheat field. But in the time I've been coming out here, in the 30 plus years that I've been coming to Gettysburg, this land has never been down to wheat. So the peach orchard has peach trees in it. Um, some parts of the battlefield are planted with wheat. Some parts of the battlefield are planted with um, corn, maize. Um, but this is usually down to uh, long grass, which is then cut for hay or, or just cut for long grass. And you can see the Park Service mow nice walking trails to the main monuments that are on this part of the battlefield. So there's um, nice short grass. You don't have to walk through the long grass um, unless you really want to, unless you want to have the experience of advancing in the path of the um, Irish Brigade and the other brigades that fought here. So you don't have to wade through the long grass and get ticks during the summer and hot weather. Uh, you can just stay to the mowed footpaths. So that's the general position that we're in. I think I'll post a map in the discussion to this tour later on just so that I've posted a map and get some idea of where we are. So the fighting here takes place because um, I'm looking towards the Confederate position. So I'm looking across the wheat field um, to the south and west and that's the direction from which the Confederates are coming in and we're talking about Anderson and Semmes and Kershaw and uh, quite a strong Confederate assault. The Confederate assault on July the 2nd is actually larger in terms of men involved than Pickett's charge on July the 3rd. So you all know about Pickett, the Pickett Pettigrew Trimble charge, uh, the big centerpiece of the battle as we think of it as the centerpiece of the battle. But the larger assault by Longstreet and AP Hill's Corps took place the day before. And it's the action that stretches all the way from Little Round Top through this salient here, through the wheat field and Devil's Den and the Peach Orchard and around to the front of um, uh, Cemetery Ridge. It's a much larger assault and a much more significant assault in terms. If the Army of the Potomac had been broken, if the chance had been for the Confederacy to break the Army of the Potomac, I think it would have been broken here on July the 2nd. Um, by the time we get to uh, July the 3rd, um, the Union Army is so firmly entrenched and its cannon so well laid and supplies are finally coming up that um, the possibility of Confederate victory on July the 3rd, mm, you know, maybe not as in the balance as we, as we sometimes think it is, but on July the 2nd, I think everything was up for grabs here, uh, particularly in this salient that 3rd Corps had moved out into. Now, 3rd Corps moved out into this salient. There's lots of gaps between uh, the units. The flanks are open in the air. As I say, uh, Major General Sickles, commanding 3rd Corps, has not sought the permission uh, to move out. He hasn't notified General Meade that he's moved out. Um, so suddenly Meade realises that there's a, a giant gap in the middle of his line and a giant hole and there's Confederates moving around on each flank of that and something has to be done. That gap has to be plugged. So men are being pushed up onto Little Round Top as quickly as they can. That's how we get Vincent's Brigade, Strong Vincent's Brigade up there, including the 20th Maine, and we get that fight on Little Round Top. So various units are being thrown in, um, units are being grabbed from wherever they can be grabbed from. So brigades from different divisions and different corps are being just plugged into gaps. Um, so you've got 5th Corps units merged up with 2nd Corps units, merged up with 3rd Corps units, whoever there is available is kind of thrown into this fight. Now the tragedy of the wheat field, I think, is that um, it's a series of piecemeal attacks, and we often see that, um, that there's not coordinated attacks and there's not coordinated counterattacks. So if I had four brigades of infantry in line abreast, 
and we advanced even in echelon across this field with say uh, three brigades up and a, and a brigade in reserve and we advanced across this field we'd put in a significant attack however if i put in a brigade and then that brigade's beaten and then i put in another brigade and that brigade's beaten and i put in another brigade and that brigade's beaten they're being committed piecemeal and they're being defeated and damaged in detail reminds me very much of the assault on the uh, mary's heights at Fredericksburg in December of 62, where the assaults are just consecutive waves against the same position um, because the ground determined it. The ground made sure that you could not um, launch a broad attack and it's narrowly constricted. And it's the same here at the wheat field because it's a nice piece of open ground. Uh, men gravitate towards open ground. It's easier to maneuver through open ground and a mowed wheat field than it is to move through a woodland and woodlots to either side of us and to cross streams and to be in like little boggy ground. Um, so it's much easier to move through this kind of land and so you kind of channel yourself subconsciously towards open ground and then you become actually a target standing in open ground. Um, it's as true today as it was then so uh, which is why perhaps if you're if I interject some contemporary politics and contemporary uh, international relations for a moment, if you're a Russian convoy of 200 vehicles moving along an open road, you are an easy target um, for Ukrainians. Whereas if you are uh, moving in woodland and moving undercover, you're not a much of an easy target. And the wheatland is that, the wheat field here at Gettysburg on July the 2nd is that problem. It's open ground. So the men advancing through the wheat field are advancing across open ground. So several brigades committed through here, um, Kelly's Brigade, the Irish Brigade is committed, Brooks, Cross, Zook's Brigade, all thrown in here into the battle, and they all fight really their individual brigade battles across this ground. So the Irish Brigade comes into this battle, Kelly's Brigade comes into this battle, and we're looking down the field as it advances over, so just got a quick look. They come down off the ridge and you can see over to here, just the side of the monument, you can see there's a road up there, which is the new modern uh, tour road. And so the, the brigade is coming down, coming through past the farmland and then across the field here towards the Confederate position. Let's see if my tripod falls over again, across this open ground. Now, when the Irish Brigade was put together in 61, and armed in 61, and they drew their muskets. Uh, they did not draw um, Springfield 61 um, rifled muskets. They did not draw um, Enfield rifled muskets. Uh, uh, Colonel Maher decided that he wanted the men of the brigade to be armed with smoothbore muskets. So not as accurate over long range as a rifled musket. We can get into the um, specifics and, and the ballistics of, of, a, of a rifled round and a an ball versus a smooth ball musket ball. But Ma believed that the men of the Irish Brigade had that temperament to close um, with the enemy to a shorter distance uh, and that the, the musket, the smooth ball musket would be more effective at close range. It would be more effective at close range because at close range, the men could fire a round known as buck and ball. So not a single musket ball, so you think of the musket ball, you know, thinking of when you're imagining it now as, the, as about the size of a marble um, and, that, and that single musket ball that's being fired out. Now, buck and ball is a complicated cartridge. On the top of the cartridge is, of course, that musket ball, but bound on the top of that cartridge is three smaller lead balls, like buckshot that you'd fire from a shotgun. If anybody's got a shotgun and then anybody fired a um, double aught buck, it's a, the same size as a double aught buck shot from a shotgun. So when you discharge that musket at close range, that smoothbore musket at close range, it's loaded with buck and ball, um, you're firing um, almost like a small shotgun blast. So if you have, if you are the 88th New York and you do have 126 men, and say 100 of them level their muskets and fire um, a concentrated fire of 100 guns firing and 100 muskets firing buck and ball. That can be quite devastating at close range, even if there's only 100 of you. I mean, if there's 500 of you, it's even more. So it was Mars' belief that um, a smoothbore basket and a buck and ball uh, would be the deciding factor in the Irish Brigade getting close, uh, getting into close combat with the enemy. 
And two years later into the war, a lot of the units at the beginning of the war that had drawn uh, muskets from state armories and been armed with smoothbore muskets because that's all that was available at the beginning of the war, um, by now, by this point in the war, had discarded their smoothbore muskets and were armed almost entirely with um, rifled muskets firing the manet ball, so rifled a gun firing the, the manet ball, a much more accurate weapon at a much more longer range. So most are armed at this point with the, uh, most Union troops are going to be armed with the Model 1861 Springfield rifle. You'll see some uh, Enfield rifles. Um, you'll still see a few um, uh, Lawrence rifles, some imported Austrian rifles there, but um, predominantly rifled muskets. So to see a smoothbore musket on the battlefield is very rare. It does tell you, though, when you're doing battlefield archaeology and you um, run your metal detector around and you, and you pick up and you see that you've got um, a buck and ball round, um, you, and you've dug that out of the ground. If you're digging up a minet ball, you know that the regiment that fought through here was armed with rifled muskets. If you're digging up buck and ball, you can be like, oh, I guess this is kind of where the Irish Brigade were doing some fighting. So buck and ball. So the Irish Brigade advance across this open ground and they advance across this open ground and because they're armed with those shorter range muskets, they have to close. They have to close with the enemy. Um, they want to drive them off of this field, they want to drive them off of the fence line beyond here, and they want to drive them back to where they came from. But they've got to close and got to cross this open ground. So it's very similar um, to the attack at Antietam, where they had to cross through the cornfield, which is a wheat field, at Antietam, um, to come upon the position that we know today at Antietam as the sunken road, Bloody Lane. Um, so much as the Irish Brigade had to advance across uh, open farmland on that day, um, through rifle fire, through accurate rifle fire. They have to advance across the wheat through through accurate rifle fire on July 2nd, 1863. And so they take casualties here um, at the battle and they take even more casualties. Now remember, they came into the battle with um, barely 120 men. So uh, they come into the battle with um, only 126 men and they're going to take even more casualties here on the battlefield but I mean they came in with spirit though so I mean even though there's a small number of them so I got a quote from um, Major Mulholland of the 116th Pennsylvania so it's one of the other Irish regiments in the brigade 116th Pennsylvania uh, Mulholland said the order was given to advance which the brigade did in excellent style driving the enemy from their position but the fighting here goes back and forth so as the Union Brigade pushes forward and pushes the Confederates back then the Confederates counterattack and push back, and the fighting rages backwards and forwards across this field that we're looking at today. Um, a brigade will come in. What's the other side of that battery? Zook's brigade will come across there. Uh, Zook will get killed. Uh, but the fighting here is quite desperate, and uh, as a result of which, the 88th and the Irish Brigade are even more reduced in manpower here at Gettysburg and then they had been uh, there too four. So there is a monument here to the Irish Brigade at Gettysburg. It is located, I'm just gonna, if you come on the auto tour uh, the main stop is, can I zoom in this or not, the main stop is just where these monuments are. There's a little parking bay down there with some interpretive sign and you can park down there and then if you walk up the hill you see how the road goes up the hill here into the tree line there that's where you'll find the monument to the Irish Brigade itself the monument is a big Celtic cross you can't miss it and it has an Irish wolfhound uh, laying at the base uh, uh, a sculptured Irish wolf handling at the base of the monument. So that really is the um, kind of like sad story of the 88th New York, that the 88th New York had been founded with this um, great hope that, um, that uh, Irishmen, free Irishmen, would lead the way to liberty here. And that also then some of those men, once they'd been victorious here, um, and then gained battle experience here, would be trained and able to go home to Ireland 
and become revolutionaries and fight a war of liberation in Ireland, which um, sadly did not happen. Um, some men that were veterans of the Irish Brigade and the 88th in particular um, did in, in later life make their way back to Ireland and try and ferment rebellion, but were um, captured by the British. As we know, the story of um, Irish history, there's uh, periods of uh, violence and repression followed by periods of, periods of violence and repression followed by periods of violence and repression. And so what we now know is the Republic of Ireland, Southern Ireland, um, does not come into being until the 1920s. So um, the hopes and dreams of the men that were here in the 1860s, uh, it's 60 years later, it's almost two generations later, before what they dreamt of as Irish independence would come, um, come to fruition in their homeland. Uh, that's enough about Irish politics for the day. I don't want to get down that particular wormhole. So um, the wheat field is on the auto tour. Um, as some of you know, I'm going to flick back and have a little talk. Hi. As some of you know, there is um, restoration work going on here on the battlefield at the moment. So Devil's Den, across here. Um, Devil's Den itself is closed at the moment to the public. You can drive the loop around Devil's Den. You can actually park there and get out and take photographs. But there's a construction wall, construction fencing up and uh, keep out signs and out definitely means out so um, please if you do come out don't don't cross those lines um, for your own safety and um, there's construction equipment and a loose uh, loose material there that you could actually get um, badly hurt um, so there's reconstruction work doing the um, park service when budget becomes available has to jump on that budget as anyone who's an experience of government work knows if you have budget that's allocated to you and you do not use that budget you lose that budget. So when the Park Service finally has um, funds released to it for restoration work on the battlefield, they have to kind of jump on that straight away. They have to give 30 days notice to close an area here on the battlefield. Um, they already gave notice of um, closing Devil's Den for five to six months. We've got about uh, four and a half, five months of work to go on Devil's Den. Um, uh, they are um, replacing um, some of the steps, replacing some of the footpaths. It's going to be much more ergonomic. Hopefully it will be uh, more accessible, ADA accessible, and they're going to improve some of the parking there as well. And uh, also it's just to renew those areas. So if you think about the numbers of people that visit Gettysburg every year and the numbers of people that walk on this grass and climb on these rocks and, and kids hanging on trees and the damage that can be done unintentionally. I don't think people are out here deliberately trying to damage things, but the damage that can just be done through footfall, that needs to be restored. So Devil's Den is closed at the moment. Little Round Top will also be closed soon. Um, sometime around the end of May, beginning of June. Currently, that's the um, um, uh, tentative outline to close Little Round Top. So we want a little round top. 20th Main, etc., etc. Um, there's a lot of work needs to be done up there. It's one of the most popularly visited areas on the battlefield, uh, as a result of which there's a lot of foot erosion. Um, there's a lot of um, congestion up there on busy days. So the Park Service is doing several things in that program up there on Little Round Top. When that closes, that's going to be closed for quite a significant amount of time. It may be closed for over a year. Um, so it will probably be closed to foot traffic. Um, you won't be able to... Um, climb all over it um, at the 160th anniversary next year um, but you'll and there'll be road closures as well so you won't be able to get your car up there so there's going to be some um, changes to the road pattern around here it's usually some parts are two-way and some parts are one-way at the moment that will all change there'll be some diversions to uh, avoid the round top area but there's a lot of work has got to be done up there um, a lot of the footpaths need to be redone um, to get access to some of those uh, memorials. The parking really needs to be improved up there. There needs to be room for the tour buses to pull in nicely. And there needs to be enough room for um, uh, uh, handicapped vehicles to pull in So, uh, and, and get people in and out of those. And a lot more spacing because there's nothing worse than when you're driving and you see there are signs all over the battlefield saying park in the parking areas. Do not park on the grass. And time and time again when you come, because the park is so busy, People just kind of think, well, I'll just park on the grass a little bit. And, uh, you know, that starts to ruin the battlefield. So that congestion needs to be done. And also there's a lot of dead trees up there that need to really just be thinned out and uh, uh, 
we come around the battlefield today and there's trees everywhere and you think of the time in 1863 there were not trees everywhere um, a lot of this is like second and third growth timber uh, that's grown in the last 150 years um, there were woodlots here that were used by the farmers for for wood to gather wood from but uh, most of this land was farmland and grazing land so uh, restoring little round top will also involve removing some of the trees maybe restoring it to more of what it looked like in July of 1863 so that will be an area that's closed so hopefully what that will do is that will encourage people that are coming out to visit the battlefield to um, visit some of these less traveled less walked areas um, I mean, although it's a rainy day and it's a rainy Tuesday, which is not a particularly busy touristy day in April for people to come out on the battlefield. I mean, I haven't even seen a school party today. And um, bringing a school group here is fantastic fun. Bringing an eighth grade group here and walking pickets charge with them and doing all that stuff is, is great fun if you're a history teacher. Um, but it's not very busy today, but hopefully it will bring um, people to the wheat field and people will be able to park. There's good parking around here on the wheat field good monuments out here with good signage on the wheat field download the battlefield tour app download the american battlefield trust um, uh, maps of the battlefield and come out and walk this ground it's a lovely piece of ground to walk um, there are mowed paths so you're not going to get the ticks and um, hopefully it will encourage people to visit the the peach orchard and um, the wheat field and some of those other areas rose hill plum run etc and they will become much more visited areas in the next year and then they are normally because a lot of people when they come uh, looking for the high points of the battlefield they're looking for um first shot they're looking for um a con uh, the virginia memorial pickets charge they're looking for a little round top and then they're looking to um, f finish up and get downtown for something to eat so they can get on to their next stop a lot of people don't have three and four hours a lot of people have a much uh, shorter amount of time to uh um, visit the battlefield and uh, hopefully it will encourage people with some of the closures and some of the diversions to come out to the wheat field. I very much recommend it coming out to the wheat field on a nicer day than this certainly and uh, just having a lovely walk out here. Uh, it's beautiful ground. It's beautiful ground. It is hallowed ground. Um, you're conscious when you look at just the number of memorials that are out here and the number of men that fought through here. You're very conscious of that in the wheat field that it was uh, bloody ground and it's hallowed ground as in the entire battlefield is. But I would encourage you, if you're out visiting Gettysburg, come out to some of the uh, lesser visited locations and uh, uh, experience those parts of the battlefield that you may not have been to before. So um, the weather's cleared a little bit, which is nice. Um, I'm gonna continue today. Um, it's coming up at uh, quarter four um, Eastern time. So. Um, I'm going to, while I've got good daylight and dry weather, I'm going to, um, when I finish this tour, um, explore the battlefield a little bit more and take some uh, photographs for classroom content. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please drop them in the comments to the video. Um, if you have, I'm going to save this video, so the video will be uploaded to Facebook. I'll save it as well as a backup and upload it to YouTube as a backup. As I say, these videos are all free. Um, I just happen to be out here on a Tuesday at Gettysburg this week. Um, so I like doing these. I like just doing these little free 45 minute, one hour tours on Gettysburg. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. Um, if you know somebody that's interested in military history, Civil War history, I've got French and Indian tours coming up. Um, I've got some Rev War work coming up. And I think I've also got a 17th century 1655 um, uh, content coming up, maybe even next week. I have to think about that. Um, so if you know somebody that's interested, just share the location, the Facebook page, facebook.com slash walking the ground, all one word. And um, we're also over on uh, uh, Twitter and we're also on TikTok and we're also on Coffee and we're also on Telegram and pretty much every social media channel I can think of, I think we have at least some presence on, um, which will usually direct you back here to the Facebook page where all the videos of previous and walkabouts and photographs etc are stored so I do appreciate that as I say these are all free I don't charge for these um, if you are coming out to Gettysburg and you want a professional tour please do contact the licensed battlefield guides out here at Gettysburg they do a fantastic job the men and women of uh, who are licensed battlefield guides you recognize them out on the battlefield and um, they're typically wearing blue shirts in nicer weather 
um, and their badges and uh, uh, very reasonable rates and um, very knowledgeable. You have to pass a lot of tests to become a licensed battlefield guide here at Gettysburg. Um, if you come out, um, do book one of those. Um, take the tour with them. They will be able to give you a general tour, the two hour driving tour. They'll be able to give you a four hour driving tour. If you want to spend eight hours here out on the battlefield and spend an entire day out on the battlefield and you want to just go around looking at artillery um, positions and talking about artillery out here at the battlefield. If you want to go around looking for where cavalry units were and talk about cavalry action. If you are uh, from Minnesota and want to talk about Minnesotans. If you're from North Carolina and want to talk about North Carolinians. Those battlefield guides are so experienced that they can tailor um, a battle tour exclusively for you and what you're interested in. So please do take advantage of that. They're the professional battlefield guides out here, um, licensed battlefield guides. Um, you can go to the visitor centre, um, you can go online and uh, schedule a tour with those guys. So I do encourage you to do that if you come out to Gettysburg. There's also, I see, horseback tours through here. Um, last week a Segway tour went past me, so there's all sorts of ways you can explore this battlefield and um, that can be fun ways as well if you want to ride a horse or zip around on a Segway. So thanks for joining me today. Um, uh, check out the Facebook page, facebook.com slash walking the ground um, for details of upcoming tours. I think I've got everything scheduled through May and um, we're now looking at um, probably what we're going to be doing in June and looking at the beginning of July. Um, so a lot of very content, a lot of Civil War content, Rev War content, War of 1812 content, French and Indian War content. Maybe July we'll be able to get um, out west again. Uh, remember last year we were able to get out and do um, Beaches Island and uh, Little Bighorn and uh, Fetterman Massacre. So hopefully um, during the summer we'll be able to get out um, west again and do some uh, additional um, western content as well as the battlefield. So thanks for joining me today. It wasn't a great day, but the weather has cleared a little bit. Um, I do appreciate all the support you guys give me. Uh, I appreciate all of these likes and thumbs up and hearts that are popping up here on the corner. As I say, if you've got any comments, drop them in the comments and I'll reply to them uh, as soon as I can get in. I'll probably go down to um, Ragged Coffee House and get a coffee now and, and warm up a little bit and uh, answer some of the comments. If you do see spam links, we do get spammers sometimes in the group that post spam links to phishing sites that are trying to get your financial information. Please don't click on them. Just please click on block and report, block and report, and Facebook will take care of that for us. So um, we can't avoid those guys. That's how they make a living from scamming us. So but please don't click on those links. But thanks for joining me today, and I will see you uh, on the Facebook page, and I will see you on a live stream tour next week. Thanks for joining me.